Hello again everyone. So thanks for sticking with this and your patience should really start paying off now. So without further ado, let's continue. Now the question raised by Schrodinger's thought experiment is, how big can a quantum superposition get? It's been shown repeatedly in experiments that small particles can be in a superposition of multiple coexisting possibilities until you make a measurement. But could something as large as a cat be in two states simultaneously? Well, there's still no answer to that. But the question has led physicists to come up with alternatives to the Copenhagen interpretation, different models of wave function collapse that don't necessarily require a conscious observer. And the magazine says, and you prefer one of these alternatives to the Copenhagen interpretation. And Stuart says, well, Roger's theory was one of these alternatives. He said that a quantum superposition may indeed be collapsed into a single definite state through conscious observation. But what about a system that's never observable from the outside? What about quantum activity inside a human brain? Roger proposed that in such cases, once the wave function proceeds to a certain point, it self-collapses due to an intrinsic, objective threshold in the fabric of space-time itself. And when the collapse of that superposition happens, it results in a moment of consciousness. In other words, he argued that consciousness doesn't cause the quantum wave function collapse, as the Copenhagen interpretation says. Rather, he suggested that consciousness is the wave function collapse, or at least one particular kind of collapse. It's a quantum collapse that gives off fundamental units of conscious awareness, just like an electron orbital shift gives off a photon of light. And like photons, quanta of consciousness come in a spectrum of different intensities, frequencies and qualities. And rightfully so, the magazine says, wow. <laughs> in this interpretation of quantum physics, superpositions naturally collapse themselves, and those collapses somehow produce consciousness. And Stuart says yes. In Roger's model, which he calls orchestrated objective reduction, you don't always need an outside observer. If a quantum system evolves to a critical threshold, which involves gravitational warping on the quantum scale, it will self-collapse. There's an objective, natural reduction of the quantum wave function that results in a single moment of consciousness, or a single quantum of consciousness, if you will. And when these collapses happen again and again in your brain, you get a series of conscious moments that give rise to your experience of a stream of consciousness. Wow, doesn't this sound like something Bashar talks about? So, consciousness in this model consists of a series of discrete events, yet is experienced as continuous. You can think of it kind of as frames in a movie, only with a movie you have an outside observer. In this case, the frame itself has the observer built into it. <laughs> this is just absolutely amazing. This just resonates with me so much. The conscious moment and the quantum wave function collapse are one and the same event. It's a pretty profound idea. Roger starts off with Einstein's general relativity, which shows that a large mass, such as the sun, would cause a large gravitational curvature in the fabric of space-time itself. And Roger said, well, there's no reason that general relativity wouldn't also hold true at very small scales. He said it's possible that if you have a quantum particle in two places at the same time, in a state of superposition, then the particle on the left and the particle on the right could each be creating a tiny amount of curvature, resulting in bifurcation in space-time geometry. According to something in quantum physics called the many-worlds hypothesis, each of these curvatures might then branch off and form a whole new universe. But Roger said no, these quantum curvatures and separations are unstable, and after a given time they will self-collapse to either one curvature or the other. And when that type of gravitational self-collapse occurs, it results in a moment of consciousness. He came to this through several lines of reasoning that are pretty breathtaking in terms of his audacity and insight, and some would say craziness. But this was both Roger's solution to the problem of what collapses the quantum wave function, and also to the hard problem of consciousness. Amazingly, he also tied general relativity, quantum gravity and so forth, into this single theory killing about four or five birds with one stone. And the magazine says, So according to Penrose, gravitational effects at the quantum level are causing wave functions to collapse automatically, emitting little bursts of consciousness that somehow result in our own continuous, moment-to-moment -moment experience of being conscious, aware, and alive. 
And Stuart says, yes, that's right. I don't know how familiar you are with the English mathematician and philosopher Alfred North Whitehead, but his thinking was very much along these lines as well. He said that consciousness and matter were inextricably linked, emerging in a sequence that he called occasions of experience. In his view, the universe isn't made of things or particles. It's a process. It's made up of events. And in the early 90s, a physicist named Abner Shimony pointed out that Whitehead's occasions of experience are very much like quantum wave function collapses. So our view seems pretty consistent with Whitehead's. Whitehead's perspective also helps to explain the hard problem, or why we have conscious experience in the first place. When Roger and I first came out with our theory, we didn't address the hard problem per se. But once the Journal of Consciousness Studies did a special issue devoted to nothing but the hard problem, we took a stab at it. And we basically took a sort of Whiteheadian protopanpsychist approach. Ordinary panpsychism would say that everything has consciousness. Every atom, every molecule, every this, every that. But that idea just never really made sense to me. So we used a variation on panpsychism that I think does make sense. And this was a protopanpsychism, saying that at least the precursors for consciousness are fundamental and built into the universe at what's known as the Planck scale which is the tiniest, most primordial level of quantum space-time. If you imagine the Planck scale as basically a complex geometric pattern that is fractal in nature, capable of repeating itself at higher scales and sizes, then embedded in that geometric quantum pattern are the presumably irreducible components of reality, the basic building blocks of existence. Physics says that fundamental properties of matter such as spin, mass and charge are irreducible components of the universe that are somehow embedded in this Planck scale geometry. So Roger and I propose that maybe the qualia, the primary components of consciousness, of awareness, or at least their precursors, are also fundamental, irreducible, and built into the basic fabric of the universe. This could include platonic information as well, such as the qualities of goodness, truth, and beauty. After all, why should the precursors to matter be present at that level, but not the precursors to mind? And the magazine says, good question. You're saying it's possible that at least some basic level of consciousness may be as fundamental to the universe as the laws of physics? And Stuart says, yes. Whitehead had the idea that these occasions of experience, or discrete moments of conscious awareness, arise like ripples within a wider ocean of proto-conscious experience, and in the model I've developed with Roger, those discrete moments of human consciousness are actually quantum wave function collapses, which occur within the wider universal field of proto-conscious experience that is Planck scale space-time geometry. I wouldn't say the universe is conscious, just like I wouldn't say the universe is entirely yellow or purple or wet or whatever, but under the right conditions, any of these can be true for small regions of the universe. The uncollapsed, still superposition precursors of consciousness are somewhat like dreams. When objective reductions occur, the universe, at least a tiny portion of it, wakes up. And the magazine says, We began by talking about microtubules, so please tie these together for me. How do these quantum wave function collapses relate to what's happening with the microtubules in the brain? And Stuart says, Well, if we look at what's happening amongst the microtubules, we know that consciousness in the brain happens about 40 times per second. It's called gamma synchrony, and this comes from something a guy in Germany named Wolfsinger discovered in the 1980s whilst experimenting with highly sensitive EEG machines. Typically with an EEG, you get squiggly lines on the display showing you delta, theta, alpha and beta waves. These indicate electrical impulses in the brain ranging from zero up to about 30 hertz or waves per second. But Singer discovered a higher, perfectly coherent frequency that came to be known as gamma synchrony, which ranged from 30 to 90 hertz or even higher, though 40 hertz is typical. This perfect electrical synchrony is the best marker we have for a neural correlate of consciousness in the brain. And in the model that Roger and I have developed, we've proposed that Singer's gamma synchrony is actually evidence of quantum state collapses happening 40 times per second or more amongst coherent, organised networks of the brain's microtubules. Okay, so part five will be up tomorrow, so tune back then.